Let's go to the domestic nuclear corollary of all this, if you like, and I'm joined at the desk by A.D. Patterson, who's the former CEO of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Great to talk to you again, A.D. Good to see you. When you see this coming into uh, practice, the coming to fruition now that we're going full steam ahead with nuclear-powered submarines, we're talking about developing the science and engineering expertise in this mm. country to mm. build them in Australia, surely it is inevitable that we will develop a nuclear, a domestic nuclear power industry? I think it now becomes not only inevitable, but rational and inevitable. Uh, I think the fear of nuclear used to be about the risks that were associated in people's minds. I think the opportunity for nuclear now is we've moved beyond that. We are not talking about the risk equation. We know how that works. But we're talking about the need for predictable electrons coming into people's houses every day. And we're talking about the failure of the process of uh, bringing in intermittent renewables. So nuclear is the lowest carbon, always on practical source of, of electrons for the future for Australia. Now, if we're going to have a lot of um, uh, technological know-how developed in this country, but importantly, a lot of people with the requisite skills, to what extent would they overlap between the, the military uh, pro project and a domestic uh, energy one? Presumably, there's got to be some sort of uh, barrier there. They wouldn't, uh, people wouldn't switch between the two, but can they be complementary? I think there are many parts that can be complementary. I mean, there are a whole lot of things about uh, managing the systems that support it, which don't uh, require necessarily any secure walls between them. I think the critical thing, though, is if you build a nuclear industry which is based around the maritime environment, it becomes very important to have uh, the capacity to have it on land as well. So at a minimum, for example, if, if we were to have uh, submarines that were based here that were really ours, one might want to have a training reactor, for example, on shore. Now, as soon as you've got a training reactor on shore, the question is, well, why don't you have small modular reactors on shore providing electricity for, for the country? So I think the debate about nuclear being too difficult for Australia is essentially over with the steps that have been taken in the last few days. The question is now, how soon can a rational energy policy for the person uh, living um, in the cities and in the country when will they get the electrons from modern nuclear power plants? Well, we already know, uh, when it comes to submarines, how long it's going to take to build up the expertise and, uh, and yeah. the equipment and the like. And so, you know, you know, it's a late decision. If we'd done this back in the 80s, we would have been so much better off now. But you've got to get started. Now, what concerns me is with the domestic nuclear energy industry, it seems to me, given what we want to do with emissions, that it is inevitable. Surely the sooner we start... Uh, you know, obviously, the, the sooner we'll be going to be able to reap the benefits. Well, now we can get the synergies. So I think the benefits come with the immediate synergies. I think the poli policy change is inevitable, so why don't we do it early? And then I think there are many options. We can build small modular reactors on old cold sites. Uh, we can reduce the complexity of our grid. I think South Australia is already in a mess, and the Premier there has asked to talk about nuclear and got slapped for that. So I think if you just think of South Australia, for example, the logical thing for them is to have a couple of nuclear uh, reactors balancing their grid and providing reliable electrons. They cannot do that. It seems a no-brainer. The only argument the South Australian Labor Premier's got against nuclear is the economic one. Now, you're still working in this, in this industry here and around the world. Tell us about the economics of uh, nuclear electricity over the life cycle of a plant. So the economics are good. I think what people don't understand is that there's such an emphasis, which is a historical anti-nuclear emphasis, on the cost of construction. But what people forget about nuclear is that once you've got the plants, they're always on, they were always operating, and so you don't have to deal with intermittency. There's no overbuild with nuclear. You build what you need. And so when you take the aggregated price to the customer, the lowest cost systems in the world have got between 60% and 40% nuclear in them. Now, I think in the Australian situation with a long, thin grid, we should be looking at closer to 60% nuclear. But with 40% nuclear, we'd have some of the lowest cost electricity in the world. Do you believe... Uh, you, you're well aware of the political impediments to this point. Do you believe, though, we'll go down this path in the medium term? I think we should certainly be talking about uh, lifting the ban immediately. I think the ban is kind of a psychological block for the, all of politics, and it comes from a strange moment in Australian politics. By unwinding that strange uh, moment, we create a platform for a proper discussion. I think medium term is a little bit too long. 
I'd be looking at uh, getting onto the small modular reactor programs around the world now, building up a workforce that would be a swappable and parallel unit, uh, workforce with the, uh, with the um, submarines, and then build an industry which would be a robust industry for the region.